I started working in a boatyard painting bottoms in 1972 for $2 an hour. And you couldn't make a living then, even then. But after I was in the boatyard for a couple weeks, I, they upped me to $5 an hour and you could live on that. Hey, welcome back. I'm Chris Chase with the Western Flyer Foundation. In this episode, episode 31 has been in the works for a while, and I got a good feeling you're going to enjoy it. But before we dive into it, I figure I better give kind of an update on the project. There are still two or three shipwrights working on the boat daily, but it's kind of all that pickup work. It's sanding, painting, uh, cutting off bolt heads, breaking down scaffolding, cleaning up around the project, all that stuff that kind of gets left behind when you're running a big crew of shipwrights. There is one major thing still happening on the boat. Um, Greg Friedrichs and Tim have been working on the interior bulkheads. There are six main bulkheads that break the boat up into compartments, crash bulkheads or engine room bulkheads, classroom bulkheads, and I have been gathering lots of footage of them working. And when they get a couple of those installed here in the next couple of weeks, I definitely will put together an episode that really spotlights that part of the project. But during this little bit slower period when there's not a ton of things going on with the boat, I thought I'd step back again and spotlight again one of those great stories that just surrounds the Western Flyer. In this episode, we're going to meet a sailor, a shipwright, a woodworker, a welder, and by the end of the episode, you're going to see a very passionate knife maker. I first met Dave last fall when he came to Port Townsend to meet me and to share his story. The visit may have only lasted an hour or so, but I knew the second he hopped on his motorcycle and rode off, I had to hear more. In the days that followed, I started scheming. And then out of the blue one day, a knife showed up in my mailbox. And right then and right there, I knew I had to share Dave's passion for knife making and his connection with the Western Flyer with the world. A few weeks later, just before Thanksgiving, I made the trip north to San Juan Island. Three bridges, five islands, and two ferry boats later, I was at Dave's front door. I arrived at his shop mid-afternoon, and it was perfect. Dave is one of those kind of people that you meet that makes everything. His house, his shop, half the tools inside of his shop, even the airtight wood stove sitting in the corner. It was all built over time, with care and love at every turn. It was exactly what I expected. The whole cannery, including the carpenter shop, all ran on overhead belts. And they, 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 um, I had a in, my, in the carpenter shop, I had a a 36-inch tilting arbor bandsaw. I had another smaller bandsaw, a Greenlee 12-inch table saw, a planer that uh, is just a huge thing with tracks on it. It looked like an upside-down bulldozer. It had tracks on it. It was just a leftover from 1920. And all this stuff all worked. Oh, and there was a giant uh, joiner. There was a 12-inch wide joiner. All this all worked off of one big seven-horsepower DC motor. And, and you fire it up, and it turns, and then you move some levers around, and you get the belts to go, and then all of a sudden all this stuff starts working. So it was a, it was a pretty fascinating way to do it. it a lot more dangerous than today. But it was, it was still, it was, it was pretty exciting way to go. Name's Dave Burr. I'm a knife maker. Been a knife maker for 35 years, pretty much part time. For the most part, um, it came in between the times I wasn't in Alaska working. One day I was down at the Bellingham saw shop and there's this big wooden box there all full of saw blades. 
and I asked the guy, what, 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 is, what is this beat up old box? It looked like it had been drug around the block a few times. I, I asked him what, it, what was going to, he says, well, that's it for Alaska Packers. They go up to Alaska every year in the summer and, and they have a shipyard up in Blaine and uh, they, wanna, uh, they, they want to get their saw blades ready for the trip up to Alaska. So I said, that sounds like fun. So I went home and called them up on the phone. They hired me over the phone. I said, come on to work. We need people to get our boats ready to go north. When I started out, the first couple of hundred knives I made, I made out of saw steel. It's good steel. It's got about 2% nickel. And this is was shined up like this back then, and it's kept the shine all along. Uh, of course, I haven't used it. You would handle because there was a yew tree in the backyard, so that was kind of handy. And a very early leather sheath. Now everything's a little bit more sophisticated. This is five pieces of metal. You've got a you've got a piece of Damascus. You have a piece of Damascus on the outside. You have a little piece of eighth inch copper. You have your blade and then you're back to another piece of copper and another piece of Damascus. So I put all these guys together and, and, and I weld them up with, uh, with a silver solder. The silver solder I use is 56% uh, silver. What it really means is that it's going to flow very well. Silver is, is, is a, it really capillaries. The, 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 the action of silver soldering is a capillary action. Once you get the metal soft enough, molten, it flows all over the place. And silver is very, very good for that. This is oxyacetylene. This is, this is not your friendly little propane torch. Uh, we're going up to four or 5,000 degrees if we need it. We don't in this case. We're going to warm this guy up to about, about 1,100 degrees. Just about the time it starts getting red. Bingo. There you go. And you filled in that whole name. That's it. That came out pretty good. Most of my steel that I used is, is 5160. I've been buying that from an outfit in Chicago for 25 years. I just order it. It's 51 spring, 5160 is a spring steel. And it's what your, your, if you've got a Ford, your springs on your Ford are made out of 5160. It's got about three quarters of 1% carbon. And it, it makes a very, very good knife, very tough knife. Uh, this is called Damascus steel because some of it initially came from Damascus and um, uh, it, or it was distributed. Initially it came from probably um, western, northwestern China. This particular steel has what they call L6. I call L6. It's an old steel. It's the old saw steel. It's a steel with a little bit of nickel in it. And that the nickel is what comes out as the bright part. The other steel is 5160, one of your chrome steels. And that's what comes out as the dark part. So basically, this is a simple steel. It, you don't have, it don't have a lot of exotic stuff. Of all the books that I read, one of them distinctly was, was the Sea of Cortez that inspired me to... Um, to pick up that phone and talk to a guy in the boat yard, to go down to a boat yard, to think more about boats. Even though I had a slight boating, or I was in the Navy previous, I'd been in the Navy, so I kind of understood the ocean a little bit. But I'd been reading a lot of books about it, and this one was highly motivating. It, it stuck with me um, more than some of the other books. The Sea of Cortez was, was um, it was doable. 
I, I, I felt that the ocean was something that was true. It was, there was an honesty. And um, I, 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 I felt that I could find what I was looking for by doing boat work, building a boat, going sailing, things like that. And, and uh, Steinbeck inspired me to do that. And that's what, I, that's what I always felt the ocean was. It was, it was a river of belief. Things were true out there. The laws of the ocean were honest. So I was inspired to go out and look for this degree of honesty that I couldn't find in the culture. So we got our pins in, we've drilled all our lightning holes, we've drilled our pin holes, uh, we've got our name in there, we've got a mark right here where your bolster's going to be. So let's step over here and we'll do a little heat treat. And what we're going to do is we're going to run this knife up to about 15, 1600 degrees. And you just kind of heat the whole thing slowly. It's got to be heated on both sides. You watch your colors. There's your oxid. You can see your oxidization colors coming in. All we're going to do, all we really want heat treated is the edge of the blade, maybe three eighths or a half an inch. Got to do both sides the same. I work by color. I know what color that, what, how hot that is by the color. We're real close to where we want to be. Real close. Got to make sure both sides. Get it well soaked. That's about 15 or 1600 degrees. Right there. Looks real even. Dunk it and keep moving. Always keep moving. Always keep this moving. Otherwise, that 1500 degrees cooks the oil right away and it doesn't cool. You've got about two seconds to get this thing from 1500 degrees to zero. Found an old boat and, and at that age we, I couldn't afford fiberglass or anything fancy so it was going to be a wooden boat and that's what I really got into. I found an old sunk boat and I raised it and rebuilt it and then took it sailing. Went to Mexico and the South Pacific for a couple years and that, that was really cemented me to building boats and to, to um, uh, just changed my attitude about life. I li live a little bit smaller and I think back then I had about twelve thousand dollars in that boat when we left. Um, I bought it on the bottom for a thousand dollars and uh, I bought it from the insurance company. They didn't know what to do with it. They just stood out there and looked at this thing and they did, had no idea what to do with it. And, and because uh, apparently the, the, it was it was sunk and it was their their responsibility. So I bought it off of them and went inside the boat and blew up a little inflatable boat, and that was just enough to give it the buoyancy. And then towed it to a boatyard and had it hauled out. And that's that's what started the real involvement with wooden boats. Uh, it needed a new stem, a lot of new planking, and a uh, new keel. And. Well, we left San Diego in 75 and about 14,000 miles total in about two years that we sailed it. We'd met a lot of people when we were traveling and they all wanted to, um, they wanted us, the people from the Northwest, 
and they wanted us to come up to the Northwest and check it out. So we did. Usually the secret is to starting over as you break out your hammer and you hammer your mistake off. Temper on the blade. This is a triple aught tip, the smallest tip they make for this particular torch. We're going way down. This is another part of the process that takes a while because if you just throw your torch at it, your, your brass heats up first. You got to bring that that big hunk of metal that's underneath the brass, you got to bring it up real slow. It's one of the few processes that I do that I get to lean. Yeah, it, it's going to take a couple minutes to bring that up the way I want it. And you got to bring the whole thing up. You can't bring just part of it up. So you got to bring up your clamp. And this. The soft solder is actually quite a bit more critical than your silver solder because it's going to flow and be real cute at about 300 degrees, but you get up to four or five and it, it's too hot for it. It won't flow right. I went over there and I saw it. Wow, there it is. That's the real thing. I wondered what they were going to do with it. And I, I noticed that the, there was a rolling chalk, rolling chalks on it. And the cap on the rolling chalk was a piece of iron bark. And I, I looked at that. Well, it's kind of fallen off. And I came back about a month later. Linda and I came back through. We were coming back from California. And that same piece of wood was, looks like it was falling off. And it fell into the back of my truck. And I said, wow, I got a piece of the Western Flyer. I was just, I was just ecstatic. So I brought you some more wood. Wow. Because you didn't have enough, I don't think. <laughs> this time I grabbed you some iron bark. Holy cow. Yeah. Some oh, of the wow. uh, old bug shoes. So I, I got a stack of it here. I got a pile. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a bunch of knives with it. I'm going to make Damascus knives. I'm going to use some... Ivory, some of the ivory that I have, and um, some of the copper and steel, and make a bunch of knives. I did get a knife back here a couple years ago that a guy fell in the ocean, salt water, and the knife was in his pants, and he took the pants off and rolled them up wet and stuck them in a corner, and it was there all winter. And then he brought the knife in and asked me if I could fix it, and I just told him, yeah, I can grind all that rust off. It'll be a little smaller knife, but I can, and so you can bring, usually bring a knife back. old and beat up to make not to make boats anymore and uh, so it's it's knives and and that's it's okay I'm, I'm real proud to be a small part in its reconstruction I'm real happy to be there
That is it, the end of another chapter in the rebuilding of the Western Flyer. First off, thank you to Dave and Linda for all their wonderful hospitality, allowing me to come up to the San Juan Islands for a weekend and spend some time learning about knives. I really enjoyed it. And Dave provided all of his contact info. I'll be putting that in the description box so you can reach out and get your own knife. I think he made up a few knives using some of that uh, Western Flyer wood I brought up to him. So definitely grab one of those knives if you're interested interested, you will not be disappointed. They actually sent me home with a, a couple of knives, one for myself. This is a rigging style knife with that broken off tip that's Damascus steel and white oak from the original flyer. And he sent me home with this beautiful little drop point that is also Damascus steel, but has uh, iron bark from the Western Flyer as the handle. And this one here is for John Gregg. So again, Dave, thank you very much. These are both just wonderful gifts. They will definitely be, be cherished. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. And until the next one, thanks for watching. And I fell into a class which was a stock engine and a modified frame that didn't have a record. So I went through at 118 or 19 miles an hour, which was pretty good for a bike like that then. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't bad. You're also up at 4,000 feet, over 4,000 feet. And so I set the record in my class.